Well, everybody, welcome to this session. My name is Alex Fabianich. Some of you have seen me at the previous presentation about dynamic C++. Uh, there will be a few slides overlapping with that presentation because this, so the solutions presented here are based on something that was presented in that previous session. The idea behind this presentation is to actually show a practical use of a dynamic-like typing facilities in C++ in the real world, such as when we have a uh, database or some kind of external source of data, and we want to pass that data to another application or to a web browser, and we have a need for conversion, how can we do that quickly, efficiently, and user-friendly? So I titled this Update DB to HTML using C++ because the main point here is that we will be able to demonstrate insertion of or, or modification of a record in the database and that modification being reflected on the web page through a series of events. And we'll explain how that happens. So let's go and start. The content of this presentation is first we're going to present what the problem is that we're trying to attack here, then we're going to present the solution, analyze the anatomy of the solution, look at the really deep into the heart and the soul of the solution, give some code examples, explain the code and run some code to see live functionality, look at some performance concerns, and look for even a better solution where we can add some database-based events in conjunction with dynamic typing and get the data flow automatically and be converted automatically. And we'll close with a conclusion, questions, discussions, and so on. If you feel at any point that you don't, that you don't understand or I'm not speaking clearly, don't, don't, f don't hesitate to interrupt me and ask to repeat or explain something. Here's my favorite quote. One more time. We need good libraries in C++ because they make our life easier. Here's a brief history of data access. First, there was a file. Then there was a computer, and we r read the file. Then came the web. So we started adding more different formats, and then it came servers and the databases and communication, client server, and more different databases, the communication, putting that functionality behind the servers. And we're kind of here right now where there's a, this graph of intermingled functionalities and communication. And what we need here is some convenient way to transfer all these data from one place to another and convert it appropriately so we get what we want. The data formats will come often as a proprietary, sometimes binary, and often you need to turn that into a character string. The, what we need on the server side really is an equivalent of a web browser HTML rendering engine where you have some data here and then there's some facility that turns into something that's consumable just like a web browser takes an HTML file which is not really human readable unless you're a programmer and turns it into a nice presentation. This is what we're facing basically. This is what you have say with the browser. You have a file, you have a, a rendering engine and here's the result for human consumption. We need similar things when it comes to data sources Basically, you have different data sources here, then you have some kind of a conversion facility, and your targets, be the web browser, uh, another service, or an end user. So that's what we're attacking here. How do we go about doing this? Well, there's multiple ways to skin the cat. We do it in different ways. And there's even more on the back end that meets the eye. But let's say you can generate your desired format on the database or back end. It's kind of, you can do it, but it doesn't mean you should. I've seen a lot of store procedures generating HTML. 
but I don't see that as really the right way of doing things. You can use a dynamic language that will make your life easier in converting all those values. You can mix HTML with server-side code and compile on the fly, aka PHP, ASP, JSP, shut up. Don't like that. You can do a browser plugin like Flash or you know Java was supposed to be that, but double shut it. Or what we're presenting here, you can use a static language on the server side, and you can use something like Ajax, A A J J, I guess that's what they call it now with JSON on the browser side. So you have a static language on the back end, and you have a AJ, uh, uh, JSON and and on the client side, and basically what you do is, on the server side, it's really critical, how do you address this? Because you're going to be getting all these different formats and how to shape them into something that's consumable, which most often will be some kind of JSON or XML on the client side. So let's see what we do now. Okay, We try to select from Simpsons, and it's easy to discover how many columns we're going to get back count them easily. That's relatively easy. It's even easy to discover what the types will be once we do this select. But it's not easy at all. It's not impossible, but it's not easy at all out of the box that what you have out there to bind those things that you get back to your variables. And that's where, yes, do you have a question? Oh. So that's where basically this presentation comes trying to present how to go about doing that. So here's one solution, ODBC. I'm not sure that's a solution. So lots of code to discover everything. And yes, this will be somewhere in the background, but this is not what the user should be seeing. That's not what, the, what you will be programming every day. You're not going to be efficient if this is how you're programming. Now, this, on the other hand, is a little bit better. Now you can do all that. Oops, sorry. It went one way. Oh. So what you do in this slide here is you have a session tell it what type of the database you have on the back end. You tell it what the name is. It's your connection string, be it ODBC or SQLite and whatnot. And then you create this record set. You give it the session and you give it the query. And you stream it where you want to stream it. Stream it to C out or stream it to uh, web. This is nicer than what we've seen before. It's easier, but there's a lot happening in the background. and there will be some performance penalty as well. It doesn't come without price. What does the solution look like? So we're going to look at step by step what's happening behind that simple code that we seen on the previous slide. First, we assign the result of this execution here. We execute the select. We tell it execute it right now, so do it. We stream that into a session for execution, and then we assign that to a statement. The result here will be assigned to a statement. Now we have a statement that's been executed. And it has some data to provide. Then we pass that statement to a record set. And the record set is a wrapper around it that will give us a nice interface to retrieve the data out of it. The way I, we can stream the content of that record set is because, of course, we have defined the streaming operator for it. So here's the record set. And what happens inside of this streaming operator is basically we call record set copy and pass it the stream. Well, let's take a look what's happening inside the copy. What's happening inside the copy, there's, there's some auxiliary functionality here with the formatting of the results, which is optional can be there, it might not be there, but you will most often you will need that because you want to get some kind of XML or JSON or some kind of a custom format out of it. So typically you will have that formatter in, in your um, uh, record set. And what you will do with it is you, you will append the 
prefix, then you will copy the names of your fields, and then you will copy the values, and then you will append the postfix. And the copying the values looks like this. It's basically where you say, I want to copy values from this offset. Typically, it's, if you want to do all of them, offset will be zero. And then your end will be whatever the, the end is what you specified with the length. And that's where the standard copy comes into play. So that's how that magic happens. That's pretty much all there is to it. That's how you make your record set compatible with the standard streams. What we have inside the record set, there's an association with the row, and then the row has an iterator. So you can, these record sets are basically STL compliant because you can iterate over them. And you can do things with them like you would do with any kind of STL container. So what you see here is basically is the operator star for the row, which returns the basically the the um, operator star for the row iterator, which returns a reference to a row. So when you dereference that iterator, you will get the row, a reference to, to be precise. Here's how the operator for the output stream and the row is defined. It's basically you convert values to string and you stream it to the output stream. And this is what values to string look like. You take the formatter and then you format the values to a desirable, whatever you're desiring to get out of that statement. And that brings us to the heart of the solution. It's a class row, and we have here assignment, basically, with, which happens when you execute that statement. What happens here is you assign that value to a vector of focal dy dynamic vars. So this goes in transparently. And for those who have attended the previous presentation, it's basically this wor works similar as boost any, where you can assign any value into it. It's transparent, it will take any value. The way the focal dynamic var differs from any is it provides also the extraction facilities where you can get different values converted on the on the outside. This is the slide that basically desc describes what the Poco Dynamic VAR class looks like. And for those of you who are familiar with the internals of Boost Any, you will recognize this is basically Boost Any. It was it was ported from from Boost. It has a non template class with a template constructor, so you get a nice behavior of putting any type in there without having to carry that baggage of angle brackets, and, there, and it has a holder. And the holder okay. the holder is basically the same as boost any holder. What happened with when we looked at Boost Any, it was basically the limitation on the extraction side where you actually have to know what you want to get out of it. If you don't know what you want to get out of it, you can't get it. So for this particular use, it wasn't, it wasn't quite cutting it. So we extended it with that extraction <coughs> facilities. If you look at the Boost Any and what it looks like, you can do things like, th like this, put uh, any into std list, but then you have tho all those different values wrapped here and held inside the uh, container. But when you try to get them out, you still have to know what type they are. And that was the limitation. This is what the focal var in the practical use looks like. So you can do pretty much things that you would do in a dynamic language. You can assign different types. You can start with a string. You can assign that string to a var. You can assign to the var to a double. Then you can add one to the double and then assign it to another var. And then you can add one to that and assign it to a float. It's all transparent. So all those conversions are basically in there. 
and they work as expected. You also have dynamic uh, struct, so to speak, which is a basically a s similar like real struct, it's just dynamic. You can put any kind of type in there, and it's keyed by integers, so you can key them also by, it's keyed by strings here, but you can also key them by integers. And here's another example of pretty much similar thing. What you can also do is basically when you assign a vector to a var, you will get a array-like entity, and then if you convert it to a string, you will get a JSON out of there. So that's all that functionality is, is built in. Now, there is also a concern, of course, when you do all these conversions, there is a concern of performance because that there is a price to pay for that. So you also have basically in addition to all these things, you check the conversions and then there's also a way to extend the var to your own type, if you wish. So this is the basic var holder. And then here, this one is for end user extensions. If you want to specialize this for your type and provide your own conversions to string or so on, you can do that. And then the specializations for the most common types, such as string, uh, standard string or int or date time, and, and similar things are provided out of the box. So let's take a look at how can we use this facility essentially to, to do what we did before. Take that um, select statement and turn it to something that is consumable by, by a stream and even more than that, we want also to send that over the net to an HTTP client, such as web browser. So we're going to have the record set, which will have the dynamic var inside of it. There's going to be a session with the database. And there's going to be a statement that the user will provide. He's querying the database. And then there's going to be the row formatter that actually does the, the formatting for us. At this point, I would like to take a look at the code that actually does this and take a look at what the results look like. So if you would just bear with me to, to switch the screens here and run some code. This is what our main looks like. We're going to have a HTTP server. We're going to start this server and then just wait for user input. What will happen when the request arrives, we're going to take a look at what is this user looking for. And this is mainly what we're interested in. The, we will request HTML or XML. What's going to happen in the background when we do this, there's going to be a, a request handler here that will be created. And this request handler basically will do what we showed before. It's going to establish the session, although this session could also be global. You don't have to establish it every time. And then on the fly, it's going to format that SQL in whatever you requested, HTML or XML, and it's going to send it back to the browser as requested. So that's in a nutshell of what we're trying to do here. We have the executable running here, and we have the browser here. And let's see if we can get an HTML, and sure we can. So that's basically what this looks like. Now, if you want to get an XML, we'll do it on the fly. So you just specify XML. You get the same thing as an XML. 
the goodness of this thing is that you can provide things at runtime that typically without these dynamic facilities you, you will have to you will have to recompile your code for example if you wanted to uh, let's see if you wanted to change that query Here's our, here's our query, basically, where we're querying the Simpson. Let's say if we want to change this to do something else, you just change the query. And what happens here is essentially that we don't have to recompile everything. All we have to do is refresh, and we're going to get something else. Now, if you think this is a fertile soil for SQL injection, you're right. When you <laughs> When you do this at home, be careful how you do it. So I'm not advertising this as a good way of doing things, but there is some benefit to it. There's no doubt about it that where you can, and I personally am using this kind of functionality to, to do some, some real world applications, and it does work well if you have a strict requirements for performance, there is a performance penalty, of course. Things happen here on the fly. The conversions happen on the fly, the detection and all that. So you have to carefully evaluate what you want to do with this kind of a thing. So this is basically what this code looked like. We can look again of essentially you have that request and the request gets hold of the stream. There's a socket behind it, of course. That's the server so you get a hold of that stream and then you stream your record set and you give it the appropriate formatter. Just plug in the formatter in there, it's got the right thing. Any questions so far? Okay. This is a real world example. May not show very well, but when you have some charts that basically these charts have up to hundred thousand points each. This is live database grids. It's a ext.js based interface, and it's a Poco based backend with Oracle database, some SQL-like. It works well. It runs on steel. Yes, sir. It depends, it depends what you're doing, you know. It depends, like for example, we don't, to avoid that, we don't allow the, the query to be specified because for our environment it's, it's sufficient. I didn't repeat the question. The question was how is this susceptible to S SQL inject injection? It would be susceptible to SQL injection, say if you pass your SQL statement through a URL. So then, you know, anybody could issue any SQL command. If you put it in your in your request body, you're a little bit safer. But then you know you probably want to do HTTPS and and, and other things to. So you, the, the, I mean, I'm not saying there are no ways to make it safe. You just have to be aware that there are potentials here of exploiting yeah, things. But obviously, you would have to. From what you said, you would have to allow That's right. That's right. Yes, yes, of, of course, of course, yes, there, there, there are ways. I'm, I'm just I'm just saying I'm not unaware of the dangers that, you know, <laughs> might be introduced here if you're not careful what you're doing. So I'm just warning people, hey, if you want to do this, it's a powerful thing, but be aware that you may do some things that can be, you know, dubious from the security standpoint. So it's really dynamic. Well, in a sense, it is. You instantiate values at runtime, but really it's all static under the hood. It's all strongly typed. It's early bound. The way you achieve this is you utilize the weaknesses in the C++ type system, those loopholes, you know, void pointers and things like that, unions where you can kind of subvert the strong type system and then you can 
allocate on the fly and there are different techniques that I talked about in the previous session. But it's a good, very, very useful in, in practical life because it allows you to do things quickly and it allows you to do things that we normally think of as a domain of dynamic languages or languages such as what I mentioned before, solutions like PHP and ASP, which are really from a design standpoint kind of dirty where you're mixing HTML and, 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 and minor. This is uh, the separation here is it's pretty nice because you have your client side, JavaScript, you have your back end, server, you have your data outside and there is a, there is a clean separation of those. So if you dig deep enough, there is no such thing as dynamic with C++. That's pretty much how it is. If you need performance, there's a way to get performance as well. There's actually several ways to get performance. We're going to look at what that looks like. Let's say if you really want to, you don't want the dynamic discovery, like you can use select from and you give it to the record set, and the record set will take care of figuring out how many columns, what types, and all that. If you don't want that performance penalty, then you will declare your type. Okay, I know what my thing looks like in the database. I know what types there are. So here they are. Their name is a string, address is a string, and age is an int. So I want to pass that to the framework, and then the performance will improve. What you do is you have to write quite a bit of code here. It's kind of ugly, but it's not really a big deal. You just won't write your, your binding, and you, you write your size, telling the framework, how big this data binding is. So it's three, three values. And then you do binding for the name, address, binder, and, and you do the extraction so the system knows how to do it. It's all templated. So it's all compile time. And life's good again. So what you do is you declare that person here, and then you say, for example, inserting the person values, three question marks, and just give it the person. It's going to figure it out. There's three values in there in that struct. There's a type handler that tells the framework how to do it. And this will work fine. Yes, sir? Perhaps, but I am not at all familiar with Boost Fusion. It could be, but I, I'm really, really not, not familiar with it. Sure, up. anybody who has any questions offline, I'll be available. This is my last talk. <laughs> I had two this morning, <laughs> and I know I'll be done with it in about an hour, and we can talk about all those things. You can also put that person in a vector. If you have more than one person, like the whole Simpsons family, you do that in like this. You just create a vector. You say select into people. Right now, just execute, and it's going to fill up your vector. It's going to resize it automatically. If you don't want allocations, obviously, you'll do some reserving here and whatnot. There are also other ways to improve the performance if you need bulk uh, operations, say, with the ODBC, with the backends that support that. Uh, you can do that, too, but there are some limitations what can be done there. But you can quite bit. I've seen with some, some database backends, you can improve your performance with the bulk operations up to 10 times. But then also you're limited with the pod types. Obviously, you can't pass std string into a bulk operation because it's not contiguous. And so there are, there are some limitations there. <coughs> yes, sir. Ah. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We took it from there, yes, yes. Perhaps I should have put it in the tray, but yeah, that's where we, that's where we took it. It is, uh, as a matter of fact, when we started working on it, we asked them if they want to join the project. They didn't want to. We like the syntax and we take it. What's controversial there is a comma operator. Yep. Should you or should you not? The question, I'm sorry, I, I didn't repeat the question again. The question was that the interface presented here is very similar to the Saucy interface. And in fact, we took that interface from Saucy and we asked them, joined the project, they were thinking about it, decided not to, we took that and developed our own thing. To overload or not to overload the comma operator. I personally don't see a harm here. I'm not saying you should go wild overloading comma operator, but I don't really see a big harm here. It kind of looks nice syntactically. 
I personally like it. It's been working. It, it works fine. I use it in, in real world. It works fine. So I don't see any problem there. Yes, sir. You can have whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Whatever your back end will bear, we just pass it through. We do not get involved with parsing. We, For us, the statement is a black box. So that's a design decision. You do give up some power by doing that, but we forward that totally to the back end. And whatever back end you have, you, we also support the store procedures. You can pass in out parameters and store procedures if your back end supports that. Oracle, SQL Server, all that works. You can also do this. This comes out of the box, so you don't have to define your own struct. You can have uh, a tuple of string string in as a person, and you can have a vector of persons as a people. So it's going to be a, a vector of tuples. And then you populate, and then you insert like this, and it will work out of the box. Because the type handlers for tuples up to 20 members are built into the framework. So this just works. And it's all static. And you can do the same thing. You can select back into the vector. The vector is going to get sized appropriately. And it works. So the title was about pushing data from, from database to, <laughs> to the browser. And we've, we've been just pulling stuff so far. So I'm getting ready to embark on the push part. So what we want to do here is something like this. We have a database, and we have a user on the other end. And he's sitting in front of a web browser. And what he wants is he wants to look at the web browser. And when something happens in this database, he just wants it to show there. He doesn't want to refresh. He doesn't want to do request response. And as it turns out, there's a convenient vehicle for that in WebSocket that will do the job, which is basically a socket that you open with your HTTP server. It's pretty much your, you upgrade your HTTP connection. You open that pipe between the web client and the web server. And now it's open, and you can push things to the server. Very, very nice. When you have an industrial process, and you want to push stuff from your machinery to the web interface for an operator to be updated automatically, it works really good. What does the solution look like? We have that HTTP server. What we have to do here is we have to register the callback with the database. The example that we're going to take a look at is works in a limited way, but it can be more generalized because the solution presented here is basically this callback registered with the SQLite, and it will only be triggered if you insert from the same session. If you open another session, insert there, then it won't, it won't trigger that callback. You can work around it by defining triggers and external functions. It was too much for the presentation, so I did the simple thing. But it does, this, it does the same. It achieves the same goal. So you register that callback with the database. On this side, you have the WebSocket. In between, you have a good old record set, dynamic wire, and row formatter that do the job of formatting things exactly the way you want to see them on this end. So here comes this user here. He inserts or updates some data in the database, issues a statement, event happens, and the data just goes. So that's essentially why the title of the session was no hands. So it's, there's a little bit of hands here. But this guy can just sit and watch. So he's just, just okay, I open my connection, and I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for it to happen. At this point, I'll turn to the code again. Any questions about this so far? Yes. Uh, you have to support the WebSocket operation on the server side, yes. So you basically have to have, uh, in POC, we have a WebSocket. Well, just like we have, we have TCP socket or UDP socket, we also have WebSocket, so it's on the server side. So when the 
request comes, we will upgrade that connection to the web socket. Right, there, there, there are different solutions out there. This particular solution, I can show you what, what it looks like. There's a code here, we'll take a look at the code. It's based on all of these components here, pretty much here. We're using Poco data with a SQL light backend. Here we're using Poco uh, net with the Poco net HTTP server, Poco net web socket. So it's all part of Poco. But there are other solutions out there. There are other libraries that support the web socket. So. so let's look at some code here. The web notifier. Let's scroll down to the main. Can everybody see okay this code is okay. Let's just take a look first at, at the main, what, what we do here. Basically, we create a request handler factory and we pass that factory to the HTTP server. That's what when the request comes, the factory will decide what is the handler for this URI. You'll receive a URI, it says, okay, you're looking for an HTML, like we before looked at HTML or XML. It will decide, okay, this is the handler that handles this URI. So that's what the factory does. You give it to the HTTP server, and it will be triggered when the right URI arrives. The database stuff is, this is a little custom written uh, event handler application that uses Poco data and SQLite in the, in the back end. And you also give it this factory here because what you want, the factory owns that WebSocket. And you want to get hold of the WebSocket inside your, your DB event handler. The, the, this handler actually gets called, the member function of that handler gets called when the record is inserted or updated. And at that point, it calls the WebSocket. You start the server and you run the shell because we have to insert from the same session. So we run a little shell where we can insert data from the same session. But as I said, you could do this with the triggers and external functions, and they will work even from other sessions. Scroll a little bit up. That's our shell. Nothing interesting there. Some help. This will end up as a sample in the, in the Poco distribution, so I'm trying to do it tidy. Let's first look at the, since we mentioned the request handler. So basically, what happens here is if we get this request, we're going to create the WebSocket request handler. That's where we will establish the, the handle of the WebSocket uh, creation request. This one will just send the web page. There's nothing interesting there. This one we're just ignoring because the browser will ask for your favorite icons, so you just ignore that because we don't have one. That's pretty much what happens inside of that factory. The next point of interest is the, the WebSocket request handler, so essentially this is where we establish that we establish the, the WebSocket connection and we just keep on looping that. There's not much happening there in this implementation. You just receive that initial request and you keep on sitting there and doing nothing because the, the browser doesn't really send anything other than a request to, to start the connection. The interesting stuff happens here actually, because here is where we send the data that we have received a notification from the database back to that WebSocket to the browser. And this, as you can see, is, the, is in the WebSocket request handler. And this is actually called from the handler, the database handler, which is part of, you will remember, the DB event handler. So essentially, you will see here that when we create this DB event handler, we have here a notification mechanism here. So we register these delegates. 
and we say, okay, we want to register this delegate on, as on insert and on update. What happens at, at that point is this will be triggered on database insert. And the handler is here. For example, if we look at the on insert, this will be called by the SQLite engine. So your on insert is called from SQLite. Here you detect, what SQLite will tell you is just the row ID that was changed. It won't tell you what exactly was changed. So it's, a, it's not exactly as fine as you would want it to be. With triggers, you can do it much better. Because what happens here is you will just know, okay, this is the row ID that changed. And when you go to notify, you have to query it, okay, give me that whole row because I don't know what changed. So it's a little bit, you, you, you do hit the database there. But it's all transparent to the user. Once you do that, is essentially you get that, that row that was changed, you get it. And then you just stream it to the this string stream here, and then you pass that string to the that handler before that will send it back to the web socket. Maybe another interesting point here is the, the comma separated value formatter, which is one of those formatters that we looked before. And it looks like this. So all all there is there, we don't care about any prefixes, we don't care about the the column names, all we care about is just to separate these values with the commas. So when we send it back to the browser, the browser knows that it's gonna get the comma separated value, just split that in JavaScript and update the thing. All clear so far? Everybody good with it? Good, let's take a look at some real functionality and how this works. to do there. Huh? I guess I prepared myself well. So we're going to run the, the back end that we were just looking at right now. Here's our back end running. So what you get here is that boring part of the little help. It tells you, okay, this is the example. So this is how you should do it, uh, run the browser, connect to it. When you see the connection established, and then you can issue a few commands here on this prompt, and you will see the changes reflected on, on the database. So that's what we're gonna try to do. But before we get to that, we have to make sure that we have a browser somewhere in, the, in sight. This one we don't need anymore. Okay, so we have refreshed that page. Not much to see right now. But if we insert some, some values in there, then we will see the change. Let me just arrange my windows for a second. So let's say that we want to do insert into person. Let's see, let's put Bart in there. How old is Bart? 10. And there it is. So now, okay, we misspelled Bart's name. That was insert. Now we're going to try to do the update.
Pay attention to that name going right. There it is. That's pretty much all there is about it. It works like a charm, and it can, of course, be made much better than, than this simple example. But I think this simple example is enough to show the the essence of it. Are there any questions? Yes. So the ah. <laughs> yes. Um, it's the WebSocket. The question was the WebSocket support in browsers. And the answer is, it it supported, but it's not exactly as uniform as you would want it to be. There are some things that are not quite well defined. It's relatively a new thing. Uh, Chrome Chrome was pretty much the best in my experience. With Firefox, we had a little bit of a problem with establishing the connection because it was particular in some ways. There was some negotiation there; it wasn't going. We had to put some patches on the back end. It wasn't too big of a deal. I haven't really tried much uh, Internet Explorer, to be honest with you. Safari, I don't remember a lot of problems. And one of the things that we face now is one of the really oh, it's not an obstacle. We can work around it, but there's something called ping pong, which is a part of a uh, WebSocket protocol, it's kind of like a heartbeat. You can't do it from JavaScript. So you have to come up with your own little construct, you know, on the application level of keeping that heartbeat because you don't want that socket to time out or you want to occasionally, you, like, if you're running that web page long, you know, I run web page for weeks. They have to stay connected. So it has to occasionally, even though it's really nice, this solution will scale really nicely because you can, what we have done is we have put an e event notification center on the server side, and essentially the events can come from either another entity on the server side, another service, or a browser, or another client somewhere else. So you have a notification center that is really nice and distributed. So your browser, there's no, there's no re request response anymore. You don't ask, hey, refresh me. It's just you register and you wait for your events to come to you. It's it's very nice, but yeah, there there, there, is, there are still some growing pains with the WebSocket, but it works pretty well in my experience. So how do you install the WebSocket? It's supported. It's it's supported by the browser. If the, if your browser supports it, there's nothing for you to install. You just use it. Yes, you through JavaScript basically there is a way, and we can take a look at what it looks like from. I can show you what the code looks like. Uh, yes, you could you could think of it that way. Yes. 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 Uh, yes. That was that was a hack. Yeah. Long. Long. Take a look at the <coughs> browser side. I go for my own. This is the this is the web page that we've been looking at. So essentially, nothing interesting here. It's just a little bit of logging that you've seen under that table. But you just do if you have WebSocket in, in window, that means you have you have WebSocket support. You do new WebSocket. This is where. It you go to the server. That's what triggers that handler on the server side, establishes the connection, and then you you do your you register your callback. Say, when you open, you do this. When you get the message, you do this. So this is where the data arrives as a comma-separated file um, uh, string, and you just split it by commas and update the table. That's all there is. Really simple, really straightforward. Works well. I like it. Yes, Ajax was more, uh, what you had with the Ajax was sort of like you would launch it kind of like somewhere and then it would call you back. But with this, you don't have to do this. You just register and if there's something, it's going to come. You don't have to keep on asking it. With, with Ajax, you know, from, from
from the user standpoint, from the program standpoint, the web browser, it was kind of similar because you also had callbacks, but there was stuff happening on the client side that you had to keep on asking, hey, do you have something? This is kind of like, don't call us, we'll call you type of thing. I don't know why this thing keeps on saying this. <laughs> well, I, oh, hold on. Well, I end up way far. <laughs> How do you flip on me like that? I'm, I'm in the wrong presentation. You're right. <laughs> Man, this is all mixed up here. There's something about this projector that my Mac doesn't like. Previous one was doing fine. All right, we've seen this. What do the events look like? The code I've looked at before. So essentially, you create that session, SQLite, database name. You pass it a notifier, and then the, you register, basically, on insert. No, this notifier is known to the, it, it knows about the database. So you tell it, on insert, do this. On update, do this. And when the event happens, it's going to trigger it. It's kind of like delegates. It's an observer pattern. That's what it is. It's kind of like delegates in C Sharp, if you're familiar with those, just focal implementation of those. Similar. There are also other ways to skin that cat, but we don't have to get into that. So on insert looks like this. We looked at it before. So we essentially get the, the row that we have received, and then we, we notify with that row ID. Yes. Yes, all you're seeing here in the previous presentation was an overview of different libraries and different solutions. This is using POCO data, foundation data, and net, pretty much. Those, those three libraries are there. This is what Notify looks like. Yes, sir. The question is if you have to use the net library for different environments, and the answer is yes. POCO is a portable components library. So you, it comes with, with a number of libraries such as foundation, net, XML, data, JSON. There's a bunch of libraries there, and they're all portable. In some cases, there might be some kind of a platform-specific thing that might not work for some platform, but the most, for the most part, it just works. Like, for example, we support... Our logger supports uh, Windows event logging. You can do that on Linux, of course. But the loggers, all other loggers, if you want to log to a file, you want to log to a database, that all works. So yes, the answer is you, you do have to use PokoNet library for, for this solution. But there are other solutions out there you can use using the same WebSocket standard. The WebSocket loop, basically what we looked at before, this one doesn't do much. It just receives that initial low world and then stays alive, just keeps it alive. There's not really much there to see. You just create a new web socket on the back end. You stream throughout that it was established and then you receive the frame. It's just gonna receive one initially what you see on the client side. You create the web socket there. And it sends hello world. That's what happens here. And it just stays alive. The send, we also looked at that in the source code, so you basically send that frame with the data that was generated and formatted into comma separated string, and you send that back to the browser. On the browser end, we also looked at this. This is the, the code that we just reviewed a while ago. This is one real world example. It's a 3D presentation of a s steel manufacturing line. So essentially this this web page done with 3JS on the on the client. The previous one was 
ext.js. This one is done with a 3.js. You render 3D your, your environment, and then this environment registers with the backend for the events that it's interested in. So if one of these pieces moves, it will update the accordingly. 3.js. 3.js is a library for 3D presentation in JavaScript. ext.js is now Sencha. It was ext.js before, now they're called Sencha. It, it's the screen that I showed before with the grids and charts. Actually, charts are not ext.js, they did not perform, because we had charts with hundreds of thousands of points, and ext.js chart wouldn't perform, so we had to go with something called digraph, which is an open source charting, so we just embedded there. You will face with those JavaScript libraries, you will face performance issues. Not all of them are made the same, just like you know with the backend code. You got to be careful. ext.js works really good with the grids and common stuff, but if you try to put a little bit more load on it, in particularly in graphic displays like charts, we had that this particular case where we had those those charts are basically they're, they're real time readouts from the industrial process. They read every 10 milliseconds, and you get hundreds and thousands of points. And that just, it, it, the ext.js, it wouldn't, I mean, in Chrome, it would take long, long time. In IE, you can forget about it. It just won't happen. So we had to, we had to replace that. But I don't have any experience with it. I, I, I've never used it. We just went with the ext.js initially. ext.js was really nice, you know, because it had, the, it had grids and all those dro drop downs. You know, it's like a, Quite powerful GUI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. <coughs> the question is about the mechanism to avoid spamming the web sockets. Uh, that I think that would be. I'm not aware of anything in the protocol in that sense. I, I guess that would be an application level where you can say, you know, you can blacklist some some IPs or whatever. It, it will be, it, I think it's probably. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think, I think that would be basically that you would do that in your, in your database notification handler. So you, Whatever your logic is for that application, you would filter it there and decide, I do want or I don't want to send this notification. The way we've, the way we've designed this thing is basically there's a central notification center, so any entity, be it a, a client or server side, registers with this central notification entity, which is essentially transparent for them. You just say, I, I want to register for these events. And these events you will receive. The rest of them you don't know about. And you can also post events. And then you have authentication of what you can do. Maybe you're banned from posting anything, you can just listen. You read only. As far as what, what you're asking for, putting, having some kind of mechanism to prevent spamming, I think that would be at the application level, or perhaps some kind of a additional facility, sort of a firewall, so to speak, or something like that. So I, I don't really have a, you know. Sure. Yeah, we can, we can discuss it offline. Yeah, that's not a problem. These are the two articles that were published probably five years ago about the dynamic any. There's a dynamic C++ coming in the June ACCU overload. This is going to be the first part, having just any and variant. There will be others in the part two, maybe part three. It depends how much stuff I write because I, the second part will be type erasure, fully dynamic, and uh, Poco dynamic var, and then there's two more that I never didn't touch yet. It's Qt, Q variant, and Adobe any regular. But stay tuned if you're interested in it. Last but not least, a little bit of advertisement. Poco, take a look at it, play with it, contribute. Yes, sir. Boost. The question was what the license is. The license is Boost. It's BSD-like license. We do have quite a number of libraries that are embedded in there, such as Zlib, SQLite. We're careful about that. They're all BSD-like. 
There's a list of them in the documentation so you know what you're getting. The POCO code is boost licensed. Those embedded libraries are all BSD type. So that's what the licensing is. So you can do whatever you want with it. It's a large, comprehensive, well-designed framework. We're trying to create something along the lines of C Sharp and Java just in C++. So you have a really easy way of doing things. So, uh, we get a lot of beginners and a lot of medium users who are not that well versed in the expert knowledge of C++, but it's easy for them to get up to speed with POCO. We get a lot of those people. Makes C++ programming fun, or at least we want to think about it like that. It is 100% standard C++. We do not reinvent the wheel unless we have to. So if there is a standard facility, we use it. If you really, really, really doesn't cut it, then maybe we'll get involved with reinventing it. That's all I got. If you have any further questions, I'd be happy to answer them here. Or if you have something you want to discuss online, just hunt me down. Everybody seems happy. I'm here today and tomorrow, so whoever has anything.